think we can get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Sandler, um, and I'm going to talk about freedom in my heart. Um, a little bit about me. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, which is the nonprofit home of over 30 free and open source software projects. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, I'm also a lawyer, which when I admit that, sometimes I have to hide behind the podium in case <laughs> anyone wants to throw anything at the lawyers. <laughs> um, but I only do pro bono legal work now, which is volunteer legal work. Um, and I do that for the Free Software Foundation and the GNOME Foundation and questioncopyright.org and a few other free and open source software project um, organizations. Uh, I'm a free and open source software enthusiast and activist. And I'm also a patient, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, those are my uh, Twitter handles. Uh, well, mine is Karen with a, oh, there's a little typo, but it's, oh, no, it's right, but it's uh, hard to see. It's O zero Karen zero O. So if you want to tweet about how great this presentation is and how much you loved it, then you know how. <laughs> and Conservancy is for the Software Freedom Conservancy. So as I said, I'm a patient. Uh, I actually literally have a big heart. Uh, I have such a large heart, it is three times the size of a normal person's heart. Um, it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say that. It's a very thick heart, so it's, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like stiff and it has uh, some problems with it, but I'm fine and I have no symptoms. I am just at a very, very high risk of suddenly dying. The, uh, the actual medical term for this is sudden death, <laughs> which is not very encouraging. Um, and um, and uh, so it's like a, a 2 to 3% chance per year compounding. And I was uh, 31 when I was diagnosed. So this, uh, this risk compounding by the time I was 40 was very, very high. Um, and, um, and pretty scary, I have to say. But I went to see a uh, doctor after doctor, cardiologists and electrophysiologists, and uh, my doctors told me that I didn't need to worry because they have these devices. This is a pacemaker defibrillator. And, uh, and that what, that's it, what that is is it basically is implanted uh, in your body and connected to your heart. And if you go into sudden death, which means that uh, your heart, basically what happens is your heart beats so fast that, um, that it, it, it becomes inefficient. And it starts beating faster and faster and faster. And instead of actually beating, it's fluttering and not beating anymore. So no blood gets pumped. And the defibrillator shocks you and suddenly your heart is beating again, and it's fine. It's like having people follow you with paddles around all the time, you know, like in TV shows. So I liked the idea of that. When you go to see your electrophysiologist, if you happen to be in this situation, um, which is rare, I hope you guys aren't anytime soon, um, but when you go see your electrophysiologist, they have these devices in their desk. The medical device companies give them to the doctors so that they have them and they can show them to you when they tell you you need one. And they, they give them to you because they think that if you see how small they are and how light they are, how cute they are, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but they, 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 they look not so scary. So, they, the, so my electrophysiologist, and I'm sitting in my doctor's office with my mother, <laughs> and I'm sitting there and my doctor slips this device across the desk to me. And he says, you know, pick it up, hold it. It's, it's not so bad. You'll see. Um, you'll see how you feel. And I pick it up, and I look at it. And the first thing I say to him is, oh, what does it run? And it turned out that, so he said, run. And I said, well, yeah, this device has software in it. What can you tell me about the software on this device? And he said, software? He had never even thought about the fact that there was software on these devices. This man implanted 
probably, uh, he told me that sometimes he does more than one implantation per day. So over a thousand implantations in a year. And he had never once thought about the software on these devices that he was implanting over and over and over again. But he said, not to worry, because you're in luck. Today in the doctor's office is Tom. And Tom is a representative of Medtronic, which is the company that makes these devices and that we prefer to use. And he's just in the next office. I'll go get him, and he will tell you everything you need to know about the software on this device. I said, great. So he goes out, he gets Tom, Tom comes back in, and, uh, and he said, okay, okay, ask Tom the question, what about the software on this device? And we all look at Tom, and Tom says, software? <laughs> Tom had never thought about the software, and Tom sells these devices to hundreds of doctors who then implant thousands of these devices. Tom said, don't worry, I don't know about the software because nobody has asked me in my entire time as a sales representative of Medtronic. No one has asked me. But don't worry, even though I don't know about it, you can call this hotline from Medtronic on the phone and they'll connect you with people who will tell you everything you need to know. And my mother is looking at me like I have two heads. And she's like, why? Why are you even asking about the software on this device? The doctor says you need it. Don't ask any. Like, she's a very smart woman um, and, uh, and, and very capable. So I don't want to make her sound like she's, you know, she's stupid or anything. But she, she, cause she's, she's really not. But this is her daughter's health, right? And so she's freaking out. And she's like, don't ask any questions. Just get the thing you need. And I, I said, Mom, get off my back. I'm gonna, <laughs> I need to find out about this. Okay, so I call Medtronic, of course. And Medtronic, I get this, I get put into like a phone tree, you know, where I call and I get different numbers and I get bounced around the company. And each person that I actually get to talk to says, oh, you want to talk to engineering, or you want to talk to patient relations, or you want and, and I basically go all around the phone, uh, the phone system of Medtronic without any success. I wind up leaving a message for someone who someone said was the right person, who was on vacation. Nobody ever got back to me, and it was very difficult. But Medtronic's not the only company. There are two other major def uh, defibrillator manufacturers, so I call them too, uh, Boston Scientific and St. Jude uh, Guidant. And, uh, and I called them, and I had the exact same experience. Nobody could really tell me, eventually, uh, the b closest I got was that people directed me to the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, the FDA website, where there's some material about some of the specifics of the defibrillator, but nothing where I could, for example, review the source code that was going to be sewn into my body and screwed into my heart. Bleak. Really kind of scary, actually. Um, I put it off because, as one does, when one is young, <laughs> and, uh, and I, the idea that I was really going to suddenly die seemed like really improbable to me. I just thought, you know, oh, come on. You know, I guess they're probably right that I have this, you know, I've seen the echocardiograms, I know I have this condition, but I was in like total denial about it because it's your own health, and the idea that you need to even get something metallic put into your body is so weird. So I put it off. But then what happened was that every time I would go somewhere or do something and not call a friend or my, or for my parents back, they would all be convinced that I had died. <laughs> and, they would, and eventually I went to brunch with a friend and she said, uh, and she said, so how's the, you know, how's the heart condition? Are you, when are you getting the defibrillator? And I said, oh, you know, it really freaks me out that I can't see the software on something that's going to be in my body, so I'm thinking about it. And she just started to cry. And she said, this is not some esoteric issue. This is your health. You, you can't just put it off because of some abstract issue. And that was kind of a wake-up call for me. So um, I decided that what I needed to do was to actually get the defibrillator. Um, and this is uh, Bill Gates is a cyborg. So. Uh, so I have, uh, so I decided to get the proprietary software um, 
you know, it, it, it put into my body, but I, I vowed that I would do research. Um, I was a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center, and I decided that I would make a project of it, and I would research the whole situation behind it, and that made me feel better about actually getting the device. So I am, in fact, a cyborg lawyer, <laughs> which sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> um, but I did all this research about what the devices, you know, sort of about the software on these devices, and I did a lot of research with the Food and Drug Administration as only somebody who has a legal background, a technical background, because I was an engineer before I went to law school, and have a, a I guess I wouldn't, probably wouldn't be here if I didn't have a programming background, um, although it's ancient. Uh, Fortran was one of my, <laughs> one of my core languages. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so I was sort of like one of the few people who maybe were perfectly qualified to do this research. And what I found was really interesting, which is that the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, and I've looked into a few other countries, uh, and it's the same situation in all of the countries that I've actually looked at, although I looked at Brazil a few years ago, but I can't remember what the situation is, but I'm pretty sure it's the same here, that in the US, the Food and Drug Administration doesn't actually review the code on these devices. In fact, they don't even ask for it. So I, if they know there's a problem, sometimes they'll take a look and ask for it. But generally, they don't. What they do is they ask the manufacturers themselves to do tests and then report on those tests to the Food and Drug Administration. And in fact, there aren't any real requirements for the software on these devices just guidelines and recommendations. And there are some good reasons for that. Um, they, the idea is that, the, uh, that each of these devices is a little bit different. And in fact, if they had requirements, they might miss something important because each of these devices is so specialized and that in fact it's the manufacturers themselves who know the most about what testing needs to be done for it to be secure. However, <laughs> these companies have an interest in selling these devices and getting them through the FDA approval process as quickly as possible. So the idea that the manufacturers themselves are the ones who are reviewing the software and providing not the source code, but just the tests on the source code is a, was a little alarming to me. So there are no clear requirements. They're not reviewing the code. And because they're not even asking for the code, it means that they don't even have a repository of it. So they don't even ask for it. So if there's catastrophic failure at Medtronic or another of these uh, medical device manufacturers, there's no public repository. I looked into software safety, and what I found won't surprise anybody here, which is that software has bugs. <laughs> um, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that about one defect is introduced for every 100 lines of code written. Um, and there was this really interesting study that was done with uh, looking at FDA recalls, so where the Food and Drug Administration required the company to recall the device because there was a problem. There was a study that looked at these, um, at these cases and looked especially at the ones that were identified as being a software failure. And 98% of those would have been found with all Paris testing, so testing for multiple conditions. Uh, basic things you would think of for computer science testing. Worse still, there is no encryption on these devices. So these devices are broadcasting wirelessly. Now, I, because I'm, I know something about this, or rather, I was going to say that because I'm paranoid, but I'm going to revise that and instead say because I know enough to be paranoid <laughs> and worry about it, I was really nervous about getting a device that broadcasts wirelessly um, and uh, going to conferences where there are a lot of people who have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of skills and, uh, and have a lot of fun uh, playing pranks on other people. The idea that I would get something that had no encryption, no security on it, and was broadcasting wirelessly it was just too much. So. My doctor, uh, I, I actually, I went through a string of doctors who didn't believe me that this was a problem. 
but I finally found one that said, I understand what you're saying. You need this device, but, uh, but I understand what you're saying. So he called all of the local hospitals, and he found one device that was a few years old that was still sterile, so it was still good enough to be implanted um, and still packaged properly, that uses only magnetic coupling and doesn't have the wireless component. So if anyone's here is trying to hack into my defibrillator, you're out of luck. <laughs> um, but during this time, after I started doing this, the, uh, there was a study in a, um, in a university, in the, uh, it was a team of researchers at a couple of universities in the United States, and what they did is they, uh, they were able to show that you could, uh, you could hack into a defibrillator with just over-the-counter equipment. You could take control of it. This is a, a, a photo from the study, and you can see they put, they basically implanted the defibrillator into a giant bag of bacon, of meat, in order to simulate what it's like in the human body. And they were able to take over the device. They were able to deliver unwanted shocks. They were able to uh, uh, get information off of the device, including the patient's social security number and doctor's name. And they were able to simply put the device in test mode, which doesn't sound very scary, but what that does is it's constantly running little tests, which means that it runs down the battery of the defibrillator, which means that you, uh, you run out of battery immediately. And the minute you run out of battery, you need a completely new defibrillator. So I've had mine since 2008. The minute it runs out of battery, I have to get surgery and get a whole other one. And so it's completely unacceptable to have it run down. And, and, and basically, it was vulnerable in, in multiple ways. After that, this guy was named Barnaby Jack. And he heard me talking about this. Um, and he decided, so he, he's a really, he was a really cool guy. He was famous for um, hacking into ATMs. So his last name was Jack, Barnaby Jack. And uh, he would go onto an expo, expo floor and plug his computer into an ATM and get it to shoot out money and, uh, and get the screen to flash jackpot because <laughs> his last name was Jack. And, uh, and so he was famous for that already, and he heard me talk about how worried I was about my defibrillator, and he decided to work on this too. And what he was able to show was that with a iPhone in a public place, like a shopping mall or any place where people, you could determine the serial numbers of insulin pumps and defibrillators and from that, deliver a fatal, uh, a fatal dose of insulin or a, or, or a, a fatal shock, um, which is really just terrifying. He died mysteriously about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, right before he was announcing some additional exploits on medical devices. And he was only like 31. But. What this all shows is what I think many people in the room already know, which is that security through obscurity just doesn't work. It's counterintuitive when you first get into, you know, when you first start thinking about this. You think, if I close my code, it will be harder for attackers to figure out how to attack. But it turns out that that's simply not the case. So the defibrillators that were being shown as being vulnerable had completely closed in proprietary source code and yet they were completely vulnerable to attack. So, uh, uh, but keeping free to open source software is, uh, is in fact a much better approach and um, it means that when there is a problem, anyone can fix it. So security through obscurity doesn't work. So we need in real encryption. Like these devices have the worst of both worlds right now. Right now they have closed and proprietary software, but absolutely no real security measures on them whatsoever, which is crazy. There's more security on, on, on almost anything than there is on these defibrillators. Now, there's a reason for that. They don't want to put too much on these, uh, these defibrillators because anything, that, anything else that these devices do runs down their battery. So you don't want to like, have them do too much because they won't last as long, and that's a problem. But basic security, it's, it's crazy that there isn't there. However, with encryption, if, if we succeed and get encryption on these devices, then um, in the United States, there's a, a copyright law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the DMCA, which, uh, which basically makes it a crime, a felony, to circumvent, uh, to circumvent technological protection measures 
um, in order to, uh, for, for any reason, even if that reason is lawful. So even if your research on the device is perfectly acceptable under law, circumventing encryption in order to, um, to do that is a felony. So that means that all the research that's been done to show that these devices are vulnerable would maybe not have been able to have been done. So uh, I've been working, there's a, every year, every three years in the United States, there's a, uh, a process where you can file for an exemption to the DMCA. And uh, they've been granted in the past for jailbreaking phones and things like that. Um, and it's very difficult to get, and it's a really engaged process, but uh, I'm part of a group of medical device researchers that is asking for that, because not being able to even research it just makes the situation much bleaker. But I've been talking a lot about medical devices, but it's not simply medical devices. A premium class car has a lot of code in it, right? Or any car has a lot of code in it now. But a, t a, a luxury car has about 100 million lines of code. And if you think back to the Software Engineering Institute estimate of one bug being introduced for every 100 lines of code, one million defects, even if the vast majority of bugs are caught, that's a lot of defects. But this is a picture from the, um, another study that was done uh, of researchers at a university. They, um, they were able to show that they could take, uh, take control of the car. And there are a lot of different studies, like a lot of different uh, uh, hacks that have been demonstrated. Check out, there's a really cool video online of the uh, Prius hacks. Um, and there's a reporter who's at the wheel, and there are these guys with their laptop in the back seat making the car do all kinds of crazy things while this reporter is at the wheel freaking out. Um, <laughs> it's really funny. But this particular study, you can see they controlled the dashboard. So they brought it to print, pwned by Car Shark. Um, but you'll notice that the car thinks it's in park, but it also thinks it's going 140 miles per hour. So uh, pretty scary stuff. And once you, once you realize that it's not just you know, your medical devices and that it's your cars, because we all, many of us, I mean, I, I've never owned a car. I live in New York City. But, uh, <laughs> but most of us in the world rely on cars and take cars quite a lot. But it's a short, it's a short walk from medical devices to cars, uh, and then it's even shorter to other kinds of critical software like voting machines, which Brazil actually does quite well. I usually use Brazil as an example um, uh, that, that to hold up to other audiences of how, how it should be done. Uh, and uh, stock markets, basically anything that we rely on for our life and society critical functionality. But now, everybody's talking about the Internet of Things, right? Where all of your devices talk to everything else. It's not a new concept. Um, when I gave my first, started talking about this, and re I published a paper um, when I was at the uh, Software Freedom Law Center, and, uh, and when I was at uh, a Usenix conference in DC, there was, a, uh, <laughs> there was a representative of the Food and Drug Administration there, this guy who was the head of cybersecurity at the FDA, and he was, uh, he was sitting there uh, like on a panel with me, and we each did our presentations, and I was so nervous because I thought, what if I get this wrong? You know, there's, like, there's the, the, the man who's supposed to know all of this stuff is here. And so I, I put up that slide of what the FDA doesn't do. And I said, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but the FDA doesn't do any of these things. And, um, and I, I gave my whole talk. And then at the end, he came up for his, for like we were supposed to do a panel. And we came up for the panel. And he said, uh, he said, well, everybody thinks the FDA should be doing all these things that we're not doing, but we're a small agency and we simply don't have the resources. And he stopped in the middle of what he was saying and he looked at me and he said, oh, but you're not saying that we should be doing it. You're saying the public should be doing it. This is a great idea. <laughs> but the talk after our panel was a woman who was developing an application for I like an app for an iPhone where insulin, where diabetes patients can look at their phones and put in their exercise regime and put in their diet, you know, what they were eating, and then it would, it would give them a lot of information about their, uh, their insulin and their blood sugar levels. And all of a sudden, your Apple iPhone is talking to your defibrillator, right? And we are now in a world where everything is talking to everything else. We're using our phones for everything. Everything is connected. And we are only as safe as our weakest link. 
in that car study, when cars are being taken over remotely, they don't go straight for the brake system, right? What they do is they go through the entertainment system or the wheel maintenance system. And so it's these systems that, and this software that we think is not critical, we think is, is not that important to us, that the companies that are manufacturing them don't put a high priority on security. And, those are, and as long as they're talking to other pieces, those are the parts that, we be, that become extremely vulnerable. And we don't even know the extent of what all of this communication is, which means that we don't even know what our life and society critical software is. It's basically everything, and that is terrifying. So where your life could rely on just about any software that you use, do you want to rely on software you can't look at? I know I don't. Like, I, 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 basic security principles dictate that it's just simply not safe. Free and open source software has all the benefits that everybody here already knows, or you wouldn't be at Feastlay. <laughs> um, that, you can, that you can independently assess the risks, and that you can patch it more easily. That you no longer, and this is the point that really gets me about the medical devices situation, is that we're not reliant on single manufacturers. Why should I not be able to hire another consultant for my own health? Why do I have to rely on a single company because I bought their device? It doesn't make sense. If you told me that I could only use one doctor and never change doctors and never switch at that doctor, I would say that was crazy, outrageous. No way. What if that doctor sucks? I want a different doctor. And it's the same thing with Medtronic or with any of these device manufacturers or any of the manufacturers whatsoever. If we're relying on a particular piece of equipment, it doesn't mean we should have to rely on one company. And also, free and open source software is fun, or you guys wouldn't be here on a Saturday. And free and open source software is better and safer over time. It's not necessarily better and safer by default. Like, we all know that software can be problematic and it can be um, unsafe. Um, but free and open source software is, is better and safer over time. There's this study that uh, was published in 2010 called the Honeymoon Effect. Has anyone here heard of the Honeymoon Effect? Okay. So no one, actually, which is really interesting. Um, it's not about getting drinks on the beach, although I wish it were. <laughs> it's instead, so the number of bugs in a piece of software over time generally decreases. Like it's, there's like a little uptick at the end, but if we were to look at that graph, it's as you would expect. As software goes along, people close bugs and we fix things. But, uh, but what the honeymoon effect study, study did was it looked at vulnerabilities instead, so known reported vulnerabilities. And it looked at a number of different systems, from proprietary systems to free and open source software systems. And what it found was that actually there's a whole period of time where there are no vulnerabilities known. And it's very interesting because it's not what you would expect. You would expect that there would be a lot of vulnerabilities at the beginning before the software is mature. But as it turns out, for various reasons, which the study, the, the study posits are social reasons in part, there are zero, and so they call that period where there are zero um, vulnerabilities the honeymoon period. But once there is a vulnerability, it increases exponentially. And what researchers found is that, the, uh, that free and open source software does a lot better on this than proprietary software, that, you, um, that the curve doesn't uh, increase as dramatically and it's longer uh, until the first bug um, with free and open source software. But what this tells me is that there's this period of time where there are no vulnerabilities found, right? And what that tells me is that for business, you have a period of time where everything is great with your vendor. You have a period of time where you bought software from someone and there are no problems. That you have to worry down the road. You have to worry in six months, a year, five years, right? And is your supplier going to be in business then? And what are you going to do when you have a vulnerability at that point down the road? What are you going to do if you don't have complete and corresponding source code and scripts for installation? I might be quoting the GPL here. Um, but what are you going to do if you, don't, if you don't have the tools to fix the problem and your vendor is out of business? So for me, what this tells me is that for, for, for basic safe business, I would insist on complete and corresponding source code for anything that I was trying to sell because otherwise, how am I going to protect myself down the road? 
So this problem that the GPL fixes, that copyleft fixes, which is not necessarily a licensing problem, right? Like if you can get your complete and corresponding source code without it being under the GPL or another copyleft license, but the GPL guarantees it and it means that if you're in a business where you're purchasing software that's under the GPL, you should absolutely exercise your rights and get your software because you don't know what's going to happen down the road. And for our security, we need to be able to be sure that we have not only access to the software to look at it, to know, that, to be able to search for vulnerabilities, but more realistically, when there is an exploit, to be able to move fast and have it under your control. So for me, I would expect from businesses to care deeply about having access to source code. But it's also a real society issue. It's a real issue from society. What kind of world do we want to build? We are building so much infrastructure around software. Software is in everything. It's the foundation of everything that we do, what we create, how we transact, our money, our businesses, everything, uh, how, we, you know, how we talk to each other. And do we want to be building on proprietary solutions? You know, I, free and open source software is pretty much in everything. It feels like open source has won, but it's really open core that has won. It's really free and open source software is at the base of everything and all of these companies are building proprietary pieces on top of it. And the, uh, <laughs> the shift by companies to really push for non-copyleft licensing takes us away from this and we are starting to see the results of what happens when you have companies steering non-copyleft projects and where the community starts to lose its rights. So, I'm using my cyborg lawyer, cyborg lawyer powers for good. <laughs> it's a little, little cheeky of a, of a comparison. You can, you can say that uh, anyone who has uh, technology embedded in their body in some way is a cyborg. So you could argue that if you wear glasses, you're a cyborg. Or, <laughs> but I like it. I think it's funny. And, and so I, I'm dedicated to working at Conservancy, which basically prepares solutions uh, that are free and open source software. Uh, probably. If, you, if you're here, you have heard of or used a lot of our projects like Git, Samba Wine, uh, PHP My Admin, Selenium, Sugar Labs, which is the software from one laptop per child, um, and uh, uh, Twisted. We've got, I can't, I can't name them all, Busy Boxes in a lot of stuff. Um, and, uh, and one of the projects that has recently joined is Outreachy, which I talked about yesterday, which is an internship program uh, for women and other underrepresented groups. And I highlight this because the Software Freedom Conservancy is a charity, and we're concerned with the ethical problems in free and open source software. We're very pragmatic. We don't want to necessarily talk a lot, and think we're, we're a very lean organization. We're only uh, a few employees, but we want to support solutions that are extremely pragmatic and really try to solve the problems that we have. And Outreachy uh, basically helps to do this by having paid internships for women and other underrepresented groups to get a, uh, a head start and it's participated uh, uh, with uh, a lot of free and open source software projects including the Linux kernel and Mozilla and Wikipedia and if you know a talented woman who's thinking about entering uh, any kind of uh, free software either as a career or as a hobby you should tell her about this if you're part of an organization consider joining the program and if you work at a company encourage them to sponsor the program because it's really changing the free software uh, the communities it's really changing what the communities look like and how they interact with each other in a way that's more welcoming and helpful for everyone, not just women. Another one of Conservancy's main projects is, uh, is the GPL compliance project for Linux developers. Uh, it's, pro it's not necessarily a huge portion of the time that we spend, but it's certainly, I think, what we're most famous for. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Christoph Helwig, um, and we funded and supported a lawsuit for him to, uh, to sue VMware in Germany. Uh, and VMware has been violating the GPL um, quite famously for a long time. And this is another one of those situations where Linux is in everything. If you go to um, you know, a Linux Foundation talk, for example, uh, or look at their materials, you see all of the fantastic things that Linux is in, right? It's at the foundation of everything. It's in you know, it's in our cars and in refrigerators and uh, the space station and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And yet, while f that p piece of freedom is everywhere, our freedoms have never been more eroded. And the kernel developers that we represent are angry about it because many of them have contributed to the Linux kernel for ideological reasons. 
And then when they, when they want to take advantage of those freedoms themselves, they're denied. And it's, it's really not okay. Uh, I said that we were doing, Conservancy was filing an exemption request, or that I was working on an exemption request for medical devices for the DMCA in the United States. Well, there's another one that Conservancy is working on, which is for smart televisions, because smart TVs have the Linux kernel in them, a lot of them, and they also have DRM in them so that you can't then modify the software on them. And what's really terrible about it is that these TVs are shown to surveil. They actually, they have uh, microphones in them so that you can say, you know, switch to channel 52 TV, and the TV switches to channel 52. But because of that voice recognition um, software, it's being, re it's, re it's basically recording and listening to everything that you say where you have that TV on the wall. And what we found out is that some of these companies, at least one, is, uh, is transmitting that information to third parties. So literally 1984, where your TV is spying on you, and it's Linux that's inside, and because of these technological protection measures, because of this DRM, we can't even get access to the software which, we would, be able, which would allow us to turn off the surveillance. So getting, getting a hold of and, and, and preventing the uh, GPL violations and encouraging copyleft gives us tools where we can take control of our technology in our lives. And so in this particular suit is interesting because it's, uh, it's the first lawsuit that I'm aware of that's filed uh, basically to focus on what is a derivative work, which is really important, and it will uh, hopefully give us some, it's just one lawsuit, but hopefully it will give us some insight as to how courts interpret the GPL. Um, and, and it's all part of how conservancy is focused on the ethical, ideological side of free and open source software. This is something that companies can't necessarily do, right? Like trade associations like Linux Foundation can't do. Uh, but uh, but we, we, we are a charity, and it's, it's our job to worry about these issues. Free and open source software um, is software that protects, respects users' freedom. And I think that that's so important, being able to protect ourselves from surveillance. And I stand here as an American as a <laughs> with a terrible government. <laughs> no, we have a lot of good things about our government, actually, but we're famous right now for surveillance, which, uh, which is really embarrassing. Um, and building technological solutions that help us avoid that and give us the tools where the software that people will be using are, so are software that we can control ourselves because there are, a lot, there are many terrible governments out there and there are uh, a lot of terrible governments that could happen in the future. And building the technology in an ethical way that we as people, you know, we have control over is the most important thing. So software with business models that are not only focused on surveillance, but also they can't pivot away from social good. You know, I, I sometimes ask, how many people here have used a proprietary communication system like Skype or WhatsApp in the last month? It's like almost everybody here, right? We're making choices that are not really good for us in the long run. We're making choices like, Skype is already known to have NSA surveillance um, uh, in some of its packages. So we, we know that this is happening and trying to support, I know it's not easy. I don't use any proprietary software if I can possibly avoid it. I use almost all free and open source software. I have proprietary software in my defibrillator <laughs> and I have it, uh, I have a little bit of my camera and I very occasionally have to turn on proprietary JavaScript in order to get some things done um, when I have absolutely no choice. And so I know how painful it is, right? I know that the pure free and open source software solutions make life a little bit harder, but it's worth it because if we don't switch to it as a group, we're, we're never, if, if people in this room are not committed to better alternatives, we are lost. And we're gonna support these proprietary solutions that are not looking out for our interest and it's going to only get worse over time. And we have this bootstrapping problem because, because the free and open source software solutions, because the ethical solutions are not as good, we can't just tell everyone in the world to switch to it straight away, right? Like, people won't, they wanna, we, we all expect to be able to easily use our computing devices. We don't expect to have uh, huge trouble using it. And everybody here is much more um, technologically savvy uh, or potentially technologically savvy because some people here might be um, new to the field and, and that's great. But if we can't do it, 
then we're never going to be able to expect others to do it. And we are the ones who can help with this bootstrapping problem. So don't underestimate your power. Like everybody here has a huge possibility. And I'm not saying, I don't expect everybody, there are many more radical software, or I wouldn't say radical, but many more strident software freedom advocates than me who say you're an evil person if you use proprietary software. I don't feel that way. I think that it's about choice, but I think we all have the, the responsibility to make the best choices that we can with our own lives. And if you can make a better choice and start contributing to free and open source solutions, even if they're sometimes a little bit inconvenient, we're, we're basically saving our society. And I think that, um, that people feel like as an individual they can only do so much, but do what you can and it will make a massive difference. I'll leave you with this, which is that there are about three million people worldwide already that have pacemakers. And every year, 600,000 are implanted. Like, that is astounding. That's just pacemakers. That's not insulin pumps or pain management systems or anything else. So if we're lucky, we're all going to be cyborgs, right? This technology is getting cheaper. It's getting better. It's getting more accessible. Uh, they have pacemakers now that, have, um, that are so small that instead of being implanted, they're injected. Like, you don't even need surgery, and you just... So as these things get cheaper and as diagnostic tools get better, we're all going to be relying on this technology. So we're not just talking about these esoteric questions about, you know, like, oh, it's too bad that she has a heart condition and relies on a pacemaker. We're all going to get this stuff, and it's going to be great because we're going to have all this opportunity to, um, you know, to improve our vision, our hearing, everything as we age. And we are uh, we're people who are used to technology, so we're going to benefit the most from having these uh, advances in our lives. But that means we're all going to have our lives li like completely intimately rely on this kind of software. So insist on ethical technology for your future cyborg self. This talk is under a Creative Commons uh, CC by SA 4.0. So feel free to go ahead and use it and tell people about it and give your own presentation based on this. Um, the Conservancy is a uh, charity, and uh, as it turns out, uh, doing GPL enforcement is not necessarily that popular with companies that fund free software organizations. Uh, it's controversial, and, uh, and companies don't necessarily like the ethical work that we do because it's in their long-term interests, but it's not necessarily in their short-term interests, and making a case for it is tough for them. Um, and so it's becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to support ourselves. So it's up, to, it's up to the public, right? We're a public charity, and we're doing things that are in the public interest. So if you can afford to, please become a Conservancy supporter and help us do this work. So I think we have, do we have, we have time for some questions, right? Does anyone have any questions? Randall has a question. He's like waving furiously. And everybody else, think about questions. Ask me hard questions, because it makes it a lot more fun. Maybe people disagree with me. My friend, uh, Stephen Ewan Cobb, is a uh, science fiction author, but he has this wonderful podcast he's been doing for about 15 years called The, uh, the Future in You. And he interviewed me about, I think, 10 years ago. And one of the questions he posed to me was, if you had some device that you could implant in your brain to make you smarter, uh, what would you think about that? And I said, absolutely, I would not get that. And the, he, he was shocked, actually. You could, you could hear it in the interview, because he, he couldn't understand that I wouldn't want something implanted in my brain that could possibly be hacked. And I know there's nothing that's unhackworthy, and there's nothing that's unhackable. And I said, and also would probably likely run Windows, so I probably would not want it <laughs> anyway. But, but he was shocked about that. And, and, and I, I, I have quite a good relationship with him and so every time I saw articles in newspapers and stuff, well, online, sorry, I don't read newspaper, but I saw articles on Wi-Fi hacking of pacemakers and things, I sent it to him and said, I told you, I told you, I told you. And he says, yeah, 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 you, 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 you did tell me, yeah. So, but uh, your story, again, is, is so relevant to that and, and I appreciate you being open with us about that, but yeah, the, I don't want things in my body that I can't control, and I don't want things in my body that are hackable. And I have yet to see the device that's not hackable. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically it. Every, uh, every piece of software will have bugs and everything will ultimately be vulnerable. And you sort of make the choices that are right for you. The 30% uh, the, uh, the chance of dying within a decade was too high for me to take that risk. And I think that I would rather see than not see. Right, and I would take that risk. I would rather hear than not hear. And these are the choices that we're going to make. I, I'm a little bit flippant about if we're lucky, we'll all be cyborgs. But as we age, we are we we have major problems that we're all going to need to be addressed. And it's true that um, that anything is hackable, and um, and everything is vulnerable. But the thing that gets me is that you can make that quick distinction of I don't want anything in my body, and I don't want anything connected to me. But we are so outside of our body, we are so connected to our technology that we are made vulnerable every day based on software that we think is trivial. And that's what really gets to me. Um, here. Um, well, our, our brain is hackable already. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. But my, my, my daughter has a question. She wanted me to ask you whether you, you, you get any trouble getting into planes and stuff because of uh, the interference with your heart device, and if so, how, how do you get around that? That's a really good question. Uh, so there are several ways in which traveling is difficult if you have a, uh, a pacemaker defibrillator. If you're a cyborg, there are some ways that traveling is difficult. And uh, one of those is just that, uh, that airport security is harder, and I try to avoid the machines that, uh, that scan you because they're um, not as well tested as they should be, and there are privacy issues sometimes with respect to them. So I always ask to get pat-downs instead. And it turns out that it's, when you start doing that, you learn all of these amazing things about how airports work and how our society prioritizes things. There are times when I know that I just get sent through because I'm a white woman, and it's very easy for me to, like, people like to look at me and they say, oh, you're not a threat. You go through, and there, and there are other times when people tell me, like security agents in the United States have told me, just tell them you're pregnant. If you tell them you're pregnant, no one's going to question that you don't want to go through the machine. I sort of like, what? What are you talking about? If it's not safe for pregnant women, it's probably not safe for anyone. <laughs> like, and and for and for me to be like, it, it's really weird. But there also this technology is vulnerable um, on planes. It turns out that cosmic rays will interfere with the pacemakers. So a lot of travelers, or not all, but some travelers find that when they're on planes, the cosmic rays, depending on the route they fly, can totally disrupt their pacemaker. So I don't use the pacemaker functionality, I only use the defibrillator, but people who use the pacemaker sometimes start to feel very ill on planes. So if anybody here has a pacemaker and you start to feel ill on a plane, it could be because the cosmic rays have reset your device. So your device is now in um, manufacturer's mode as opposed to tailored for your specific needs. And as soon as you get off the airplane, go to a hospital <laughs> um, because you can get reset. So yeah, it's weird because you wouldn't think that something like cosmic rays would impact these devices, but they do. Does anybody else have questions? About uh, hacks and how vulnerable we are, about how do I possibly live using only free and open source software as much as possible? Am I too much like RMS? What? Oh well. I think RMS is I think RMS is pretty cute. <laughs> okay, well thank you. I'll be here and feel free to ask me questions. Thank you so much for listening.